service and in this Bible study hour that we've had previously. We hope that you'll remember the request that we made earlier, that if you have any questions or comments that you will ask us. I'll be back there when the service is over. If you want to know what we do and why we do it, if you want to understand why we do not use musical instruments in our praise of God, I would be happy to address that with you and simply teach you what the Bible says on the matter. I have no problem whatsoever doing so. If you want to know why we take a few minutes out of the uh, service to focus our minds on the Lord's death, I'd be happy to address that with you also. If you have any questions specific to the lesson, I would be happy to address that. If you will, open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And let's look at verse number 12 for just a moment. We can see that Paul is giving some admonitions here. You can see in this chapter to Timothy, the young evangelist. And he would tell them of the importance of him being an example to the believers. Be thou an example. That is where we are in our lesson. We are looking at this principle. We are looking at this verse. We have been going through this verse quite a bit. And we're going to recap what we have demonstrated so far. First, we want to go back and we want to understand. Uh, and, and we have covered the fact that the Bible emphasizes the concept that there is such a thing as an approved example. Some of our brethren don't know how the Bible authorizes. Some of our brethren need to learn how the Bible authorizes. The religious world does not know, by and large, that authority is even necessary. And everything you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Colossians 3 and verse 17. That is the very concept of, of authority in Acts 4 and verse 7. By what name or what authority do you these things? We must have the authority of Christ in what we do in matters of religion. In Acts 4 and verse 12, Peter emphasizes that it is the authority of Christ that saves man. And there is no under name given under heaven among men wherein must man must be saved. There's only one authority. Jesus would say in Matthew 28, in verse number 18, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ has that authority, and that authority is vested in his inspired word. The question is, how do we ascertain what is authorized and what is not? Well, the Bible authorizes via implication. The Bible authorizes via direct statement or imperative. And the Bible authorizes via approved example. The concept of an approved example is a scriptural concept. I'll give you an example. In Acts 2 and verse 42, as the Lord's church was established there on that day of Pentecost, it would say, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread and fellowship and in prayers. You see, on that first day of the week, they began to worship the Father. They worshiped God on that day, and they did so in a prescribed manner, and they continued to do so, as the text says. In Acts 20 and verse 7, Paul um, visiting those in Troas, he would wait for a whole week to assemble with the saints so he could do so on the first day of the week and observe the Lord's Supper. That is a, an approved example. I'll give you another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, there is an approved example to lay by and store on the first day of the week. Now, I'll be back there when the service is over with if you'd like. I would like to have an authority for, for giving any other way. I'll be back there when it's over with. I could show you what the Bible says, but maybe you want to show me some other way. I'd like to see that. So we understand the concept of an approved example. There are some examples that are given to us that are not approved for good examples of what not to do. Peter talks about the angels that left their own habitation, 2 Peter chapter 2. Jude talks about those that would suffer uh, hell fire or eternal fire for their ungodliness. They would be an example to all who would after live. Listen, ungodly. There are some things we should do. There are some examples we should look to and say, you know what, that's something I don't want to do. Timothy was admonished of Paul by inspiration to be an example. He's to be an example of the believers. That word believers is the same word used often for the faithful. He is to be an example of the faithful. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, Paul would say, But if I tarry as long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of the living God. Right? So when we're talking about that, Paul is telling Timothy, You are to be an example of the believers. The believers are the church. The church is the body. We understand we're talking about New Testament Christians, right? Timothy is to be an example in word. How could you be a good example in word? Well, we, we went to James chapter 3 and we showed that James showed the, the dangers of being a teacher. Why should we be concerned about being a teacher? Well, you've got to be careful what you teach. 
John would say, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, 1 John 4, 1. We've got to be careful what we teach. What we teach ought to be just what the Bible says, nothing more, nothing less. We ought to just do what Paul would tell Timothy in his second epistle in chapter 4. You know what Paul says? Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, uh, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap unto themselves teachers and will turn their ears aside from the truth and turn into fables. Paul authorized Timothy to preach what now? Preach the word. Pulpits in this glorious beloved brotherhood are being uh, are, are echoing out the doctrines and commandments of men, Matthew 15. Eight, uh, verses 8 and 9. They are scratching itching ears. They are, they are compromising on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They're compromising on fellowship issues. They're compromising on gospel obedience. They're compromising on everything to fill pews. That's the very concept of itching ears. There's always going to be somebody that will scratch them. But the Bible says preach the Word. What am I authorized to preach up here today? The Word. Nothing more, nothing less, Right? I'm not up here to tell jokes. I'm not up here to be a comedian. I'm not up here to give anecdotes or to tell stories. The pulpit is reserved for gospel preaching, and that's what it ought to be used for. He is to be an example in word. We've got to be careful in word, don't we? We should never offend by our, uh, by our attitude or by anything we say. <clears throat> but if, if we simply teach somebody the truth and they're offended, there's not much we can do about that. We've got to be careful that we don't offend in word. But, what, but Timothy was also to be an example in conversation. The King James says conversation. That simply means manner of life. We are to be an example, as Timothy was, in our actions. James would ask a question. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge, but he that would show this in his uh, in his actions, basically with meekness, right? He would say in James 3 and verse 13, those who demonstrate their belief in God, those are the individuals who are uh, an example indeed. All right, so we've looked at Timothy being an, an, an example in word. We've seen about him being an example in conversation. He is to be an example in charity. <clears throat> we said that the King James translated the word agape often as charity. And it's an interesting translation because we think of charity as something uh, that, that we give money to, right? Why do you, you know, when, and when you go to Memphis and you pass through the St. Jude Hospital and you see those kids and you understand that that's a charitable organiza organization and you want, to, you want to give money to that organization, why? Because you see a need, you see these innocent kids, they're suffering and you want to help. That is love and action. So I think the King James translating, a lot of folks don't like the King James. I happen to think it's a great translation. And I don't really think you could show me a better one. I think it's a great translation. And I think the word charity is a wonderful exemplification of that very concept. It is love in action. Love in action. Timothy was to be an example of love in action. Be an example of charity. Paul has a lot to say about charity in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't he? Charity needs to be our motive. We could give our body to be burned. We could give everything we have to the poor and what? Worthless, Paul says, without charity. Charity does things, doesn't it? Charity thinks the best. Charity is kind. Charity isn't unloving. Charity isn't looking uh, uh, to be uh, uh, looking to the worst interest. Charity isn't nitpicky, right? That's the concept. I'm not looking for some dirt on you, brother. That's not charity, is it? Charity thinks the best of your brethren. He was to be a an example in spirit in Romans eight in verse number nine. Paul would say, "If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his." I know a lot of my brethren think that's the Holy Spirit, and I think, honestly, that's a fairly benign belief, but I don't think that's what is being taught there because what you have in Romans chapter 8 is a spiritual attitude. Back in chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, which the world seems to have a terrible problem with those texts for some reason, but in Romans 7, 14 through 25, Paul is emphasizing that the carnal man outside of Christ, this man is at enmity with God. That was then. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now, seven, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, Paul is not saying that I in my current state am, woe is me, I am a terrible, sinful, nasty creature. Paul isn't saying that. Paul is using first-person pronouns to emphasize the truth that the man that is outside of Christ, that is carnally minded, is enmity with God, right? In verse, chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now, now, as opposed to what? Then, 
There is therefore now no condemnation of them where? In Christ. Chapter 7 is outside of Christ. Chapter 8 is in Christ. Chapter 7 is carnal mind. Chapter 8, spiritual mind. Listen to verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be, what now? Spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8 deals with the spiritual mind like Christ had. And when we say spiritual mind, we mean attitude. So when he says in Romans 8, 9, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's talking about the attitude of Christ. And you can see in verse 29, he calls it the image of Christ. And that's the very thing we're talking about. Timothy was to be an example in spirit. What does that mean? His attitude, his inner man, his motives, that inner man, that, that reasoning Capability, Romans 12, 1 and 2. The spiritual aspect of man. He is to be a, an example in his attitude and in his motives demonstrated in actions. All right? So basically that recaps what we've talked about so far. So if you're in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, you see that the next little uh, phrase used there is he is to be an example in faith. To be an example in faith. Question for you. <clears throat> yeah, this is actually rhetorical. You don't have to answer out. How does faith produced in man? Is You know, uh, when you talk to denominational folks, you get a lot of interesting ideas. Some folks think that faith is a gift. Does God just grant you faith upon, do you pray for it and God just implants it in your mind somehow? Is that how it works? Well, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Paul would say in Romans 10 and verse 8, this is the word of faith which we preach. When a reasonable person picks up this Bible and reads this Bible, a reasonable person can come to the conclusion that this is truth. A reasonable person can read about John's writings of Jesus and come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. That's in John 20 and verse 31, by the way. So faith is not some mysterious, better felt than told thing. Faith comes by hearing God's word because a reasonable person can understand that this is truth. All right? There's nothing mysterious there. So when we're talking about he is to be an example in faith, we need to understand that there are some specific guidelines. Now I'm going to take you to Hebrews 10, if you will. Turn to Hebrews 10 for just a moment. Go to the very end of the chapter. And let's look quickly at two verses. Hebrews 10. The Hebrews writer would here say, Now the just shall live by faith. Notice that phrase. A quote from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 quoted three times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. If any man draw back. Notice the contrast. Living by faith, drawing back. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. And he would go on to say that we are not of those that draw back unto perdition, but those that believe. That is, keep on believing. Unto the saving of the soul. Now notice the very next verse. We're like, Eric, well that's the end of the chapter. Yeah, but what, what's the next chapter? Hebrews 11, which is known as the what now? Well, that's the hall of fame of faith. Well, I find it interesting that we so often separate Hebrews 11 from Hebrews 10, 38, 39. The Hebrews writer tells you in 38, 39 that we are not of those that draw back into perdition. That is, we fall back. We are those that keep on going. And in the very next chapter says, in the very next verse says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things unseen. So we understand the concept here that we're talking about. Faith comes by hearing God's word. And those who are, are believers, those who are faithful, are those who keep on believing something. Now what is that something? Well, we believe what the Bible teaches and we act accordingly. <laughs> Hebrews 2, excuse me, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 says, The just shall live by faith. Genesis 17 and verse number 1, Abraham was told. You know, we, we heard somebody, we went to a gospel meeting one time. And we heard the preacher stand up there and say, You know what, there's not one place in the Bible where God has ever said that he expects man to be perfect. And I, I immediately said, Yeah, there is. I didn't say it out loud. I wasn't going to disturb it. Not that's all I'm saying. But in my mind, I was like, Genesis 17, 1 says, I'm the Almighty God. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. That's the exact word. Now, the, I know what he meant. And you know what he meant. And you know what I mean, I hope. Genesis 17, and verse 1, I'm the Almighty God. Walk thou before me. He's talking to Abraham. And be thou perfect. That word perfect means something. In Leviticus chapter 1, and verses 2 and 3, that is unblemished. 
In Psalm 119 and verse number 1, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way. That word undefiled is the same word used for perfect. What is God saying to Abraham? I want you to be totally, completely faithful to me. Do everything I tell you. That's not hard. That concept is not a difficult concept. If Abraham was to be faithful, he was to be obedient, to trust in God and do what God said. Because faith comes how now? By hearing God's word. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7 says, By faith Noah prepared. Genesis 6, 22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Don't you love the Bible? You know why I love the Bible? Because the Bible explains itself. Oh, I think that by faith Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I think that means this. Nobody's interested in what I think. Listen to what the Bible says. When it says by faith Noah, the Bible says Noah did exactly what God said. That's easy. That's simple. Oh, you can't expect us to, to be totally obedient to God. I'm going to ask you a question. You can raise your hand, as a matter of fact, if you want to. Anybody in here have to sin today? I'm looking. I don't see any hands so far. That's good. Is there a law of God that you must violate today? Anybody? Anybody got to go slap somebody today? You got to steal anything today? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? No? Okay, so you understand the principle, right? You don't have to sin today. You can be completely, totally faithful and, and obedient to God today. There's no reason why you shouldn't be. Oh, Eric, you're saying trust in self. If I'm obeying God, how am I trusting in self? Listen to 2 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 13. Paul would say, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Paul says to Timothy that he is to be a, an individual who holds fast these pattern of sound words in faith and love. We just talked about charity. We just talked about faith. James 2 and verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? You want to talk about a good chapter on faith? Read James 2. You know, I think the best example in James 2 is not the one that is most often referenced. The example most often referenced in James 2 is the end of the chapter. What about midway through the chapter? When James says, My brethren, if any of you see a man destitute or naked, and he walks into your assemblies. What will you say? You know good and well he needs food and clothing. And you say, oh, be ye warmed and filled. Doesn't he say faith, faith without works is dead? You know what, brother? I can, I can see your ribs showing. You haven't had a bath in weeks. Nobody's taking care of you. You're down on your luck. You don't have anything to eat. You're starving to death. I'm a little busy right now. Have a great day. I'm a complete and total hypocrite if I do that. I know good and well he needs something. My, my belief that he needs something should motivate me to what? Provide for that need. That is the very concept that I think that's the best example he gives in James 2. Even better than the example of Abraham offering Isaac. He is to be an example in purity. Wait a minute. We covered this in Bible study, didn't we? Eric, who do you think you are? You must be this self-righteous individual. You must be as arrogant as they come. Do you think you can really be pure? I sure hope so. I sure hope so because that's what God expects of me. Can we be pure? Can we be holy? Be ye holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Anybody, uh, you, you ready for another one? You didn't know this was going to have questions and answers, did you? You could raise your hand for this one. Anybody in here think that God would expect you to be something that you can't actually be? God says be holy. Can we be holy? Paul tells Timothy by inspiration to be an example in purity. Can we be pure also? Certainly we can. This word means innocent, chaste, or perfect. Matthew 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, what if you're not pure in heart? Well, I guess you won't see God. Philippians 4, how could we possibly be pure? We can be pure when we listen to what the Bible says. We do what the Bible says. When we obey the gospel, we're forgiven of our sins. And as long as we remain faithful to God, we stand before Him holy and without blemish and unreprovable, Colossians 1.22 says. Well, do, are there any other text in Scripture that would, that would tell us what that means? Explain further, please. 
If we say that we have fellowship with him but walk in darkness and we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. 1 John 1, 6 and 7. So as we walk in the light, we have access to God. We have fellowship with God. We can stand before God holy and without blame. Why? Because the blood of Jesus washes us from our sins. When? As long as we're faithful. How do we remain pure? Well, it would help to think about good things. You know, I don't know. Let's just say you, you talk to somebody and you're, you're, you know, they come to you with a problem. And they're like, man, I don't understand why I have such a dark mind. And, and I'm always thinking of bad things. And I'm like, well, 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 just for starters, how do you spend your time? Oh, man, I watch all these, these uh, horror movies. And I watch all these uh, serial killer movies. And I write stories about serial killer. I'm like, well, what do you expect? You really think you can pour complete trash into your brain and everything comes out just good and pure? David said, I'll set no wicked things before mine eyes. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad morals corrupt good, uh, good companies, right? The, the same concept. We have to be careful. We can be influenced. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, those in Corinth were admonished to put away the fornicator because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We've got to be careful what we think about. We've got to be careful what we put on our minds because very often that's what's going to come out. Listen to what Paul says. Brethren, what sort of things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise? Think on these things. What if we just thought about good stuff all the time? What if we just recited scripture and read scripture and, and, and thought of good things and not put Terrible things in our mind. Do you think it wouldn't affect your attitude? 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Can we be pure? Absolutely. How? By obeying the gospel and continuing in the faith. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 9. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker in other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. Oh, I'm, I'm just kidding, Timothy. You couldn't possibly. Of course he could. Notice the further admonitions given to Timothy concerning his behavior. Notice the next verse. Verse 13. 1 Timothy 4, 13. I want to make a quick point here. I won't spend much time on this. Brother Miles was saying earlier that in the in the uh, Bible study, when I was mentioning the AD 70 doctrine, a lot of folks hadn't heard of that. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't realize that. I'm glad you haven't, actually. I'm glad you haven't heard of it because it's complete garbage. But basically, it's called realized eschatology. What it means is, is, uh, is that these folks believe that the final return of Jesus, the second coming of Christ, Hebrews 9.27, that happened in AD 70. They believe that the resurrection of the dead happened in AD 70. They believe that the end of the world, believe it or not, was in AD 70. They believe that death was abolished, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 and AD 70. Right? So they, they believe that the culminating act of all Scripture was AD 70. That's what they believe. Uh, I happen to disagree with them, and I think you probably do also. But uh, per pertinent to that point, I wanted to bring this up. Because in my discussions with these individuals, I ask them why they keep observing the Lord's Supper. Because 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26 says that you are to observe this till he comes. Right? But if he came in AD 70, why are they still observing it? Oh, that's different. Because 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy 4.13 says that he is to be this example till I come. Well, the problem with this is, is this is a different Greek word. And I, I, I find it interesting that sometimes we make these arguments on these English translations and don't even consider that perhaps the Greek is a little something different. So this is a different Greek word. This word, H-E-O-S in the Greek, even until, unto, as far as. But this is a completely different word than that used in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. Now notice this word. For in the, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Matthew 24 and verse 38, that word until is the same word used there. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day in which these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words. Luke 1 and verse number 20, same word used there. Give attendance. That means to take heed, right? Give attendance to these things. Take heed. Pay attention. That's what he's saying in Acts 8 and verse 6. As Philip goes to Samaria and preaches the gospel and demonstrates that this is an authentic message with power. It says, and they took heed. They gave attendance to the things that were taught. Paul would preach to those or speak to those in Ephesus or the elders of Ephesus while he was at Miletus in Acts chapter 20. And he would say, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all of the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. 
to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood, right? To give attendance. So in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13, it says, give attendance. Take heed to these things. Now, why would Timothy have to worry about this stuff? I thought once you were saved, you were always saved. Well, no, that's not true either. Listen to what Paul would say. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Paul says, continue in those things. Give heed. Keep on going. He would say in verse 16 of chapter 4, that in so doing, he would save themselves and those that hurt him. How? By his continued faithfulness and faithful proclamation of the gospel. We're going to stop right there. We're out of time. We will catch up there next week. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to consider a question. If you died today, where would you go and how do you know? Well, I'd go to heaven because I feel it in my heart. I'm sorry. I, I hope you do feel it in your heart. I hope that you are so convinced by the truth that you have just a, a peaceful feeling, and I, that's wonderful. But feelings can't be trusted. The Bible says that we can know where we stand with God by our actions compared to God's Word. We must hear the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing God's Word. We must uh, believe in Jesus Christ. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. John 20 verse 31 says we can believe in Jesus through Jesus' inspired word. I don't need a book. I don't need a novel. I don't need the works of men to believe in Jesus. The only thing I need to believe in Jesus is this. Repent of your sins. Acts 17 30. Repentance is a change in will. I've changed my mind. Matthew 21 verse number 28. A certain man had two sons. And he saith unto the younger, go today and work in my vineyard. He says, I will not, but later repented and went. What did he do? He changed his mind. Acknowledge your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, 22, 16, and walk faithfully, trusting in God and doing His will, 1 John 1, 7 through 10. Those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful? If not, repent. If you have departed from the, the faith, come back. God said you can acknowledge your sin in prayer and He'll forgive you. That is the acknowledgement of sin of 1 John 1, 7 and 9. If you need our prayers, 1 John 5, 16 says... That if you're willing to repent, we can pray for you and God will forgive. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. If any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.